Uh, mashallah tabarak Allah. Uh, next question. So you, uh, you want to do uh, the chesbi, I think there's an easy way to do it with your palm. The lines in between, you can just calculate them and then begin to use them from there. So you can get some bit of uh, reward from using the chesbi. May Allah make it easy for us. The next question uh, to Dr. Jaber. Uh, can I pray the night prayer? Uh, can I pray the night prayer for uh, while... Okay. Can I pray the night prayer while my wife is lying beside me? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Amma ba'du wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The sunnah of praying night prayer or obligatory prayer if you are praying with your wife is that she should stay behind you. This is because of authentic hadith reported by Imam al-Bukhari on the authority of Anas bin Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. He said, we invited the Prophet Sallallahu to our house to pray. My mother invited him, uh, Umm Sulaim, and when he came, we prayed in our house. I and the Prophet standing shoulder to shoulder, and my mother standing behind us. She is the mahram of Anas. If a woman can stand shoulder to shoulder with a man, she could stand with her son, Anas. Also, there is another hadith in Sahil Bukhari and Muslim, that when the Prophet ﷺ was praying, this is not a night prayer, and he's asking about night prayer, that when the Prophet ﷺ prayed night prayer in his house, he was with Abdullah ibn Abbas, and Maimuna was behind them. So now, Maimuna, the Prophet ﷺ, and Abdullah ibn Abbas shoulder to shoulder, while Maimuna praying behind them. This is the sunnah, and this is the fatwa of scholars. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. All right, Zakhla Khairan Sheikh. The next question to uh, Brother John. How can we create a relationship between our teenagers and Allah? Because uh, being a teenager is a critical stage and a transition stage to become a youth. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wabarakatuh. I think the question is a bit late because you're asking about the teenager and trying to create the bond between the teenager and Allah. And you should start much younger. You know, subhanAllah, as soon as the children get to a certain age of around seven, you can start teaching them to pray. Also before that, even in Africa, many people, they're learning the Qur'an, children learning the Qur'an from very young age. Also going to the masjid with their father. All these things are going to connect them with Allah. And education, making sure that they're in good Islamic education, good schools, good friendship. But don't wait until they become teenagers. Don't wait until they become rebellious and they don't want to pray and they're not interested in Islam. You have to start from a very young age, inshallah. So I'd like to pass it to Sheikh Asim if he has any extra advice, inshallah. I'm still a teenager, why are you asking me? <laughs> Well, actually, it's never late, but what Brother John had said is true. Malik ibn Nabi was asked, how can I upbring my son in an Islamic way? So he said, how old is your son? So the man said, four months old. He said, you're too late. Why? Because raising up a family begins before marriage. This is by selecting the righteous woman, and the righteous woman is not only in hijab, niqab, gloves, and Batman. No, a righteous woman is that plus being kind, compassionate, soft-spoken, uh, uh, easy to get by with. You don't want a boss in the house. And selecting the man. So you don't look for a man with a long beard and a short thobe and a big miswak in his pocket this is good by itself but he has to be generous he has to be soft-spoken he has to be a real man that can be your rock can defend you can take care of you never humiliates you never insults your beauty or ugliness depending on how he's looking at it a real man 
If you begin from this, and there's good communication, and he wakes you up in the middle of the night to pray two rak'ahs with him, and you uh, uh, prepare sahur so that he can fast Mondays and Thursdays, and you encourage him not to earn any haram money, you will have excellent children with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. So, okay, Sheikh, we're late. What to do? Oh, divorce my wife. Bingo. No, no, no. Relax, sit down. Some brothers are already leaving. No, no, wait. What you should do is that you have to minimize the damage. So it is a, a risk management. I have a child. What are the things that I can bring him closer to Allah in? And what are the things that I cannot? And try to utilize this. Our biggest mistake is when we all of a sudden wake up and say, my teenage son or daughter are not practicing. Okay, tomorrow they'll be practicing 100%. Shoving it down their throat, it will make them vomit, maybe suffocate, maybe die. So you have to utilize the resources you have. You have to make a feasibility study. Okay, I cannot have my son pray five times a day in the masjid. I know he will not. So I'll try to minimize the amount of haram he's doing. So I'll try to inject in his heart the fear of Allah when he's alone, let alone when he is in public. Once I introduce him to Allah, how beautiful Allah is, the beautiful names of Allah and his attributes. When I increase the dosages of aqeedah, of fearing Allah, of loving Allah, of depending on Allah, having tawakkul on Allah, on seeking refuge in Allah, on not asking anyone but Allah, the more he's stronger, the closer he is to Allah, and the easier it is to convince him in other things. But this may take another conference, inshallah, next year. And Allah knows best. Mashallah, Sheikh, still hold on to the mic. This is your question. I should get overtime for this. <laughs> uh, if uh, Sheikh asks him, if a person studied haram science, what advice would you give him, haram science? First of all, he has to quit. Because if you are, if you have gone through this, so... I have uh, um, a degree from Gerard in New York, in fine arts, in music, in uh, theater, in whatever. Now I saw the light. Allah guided me. What to do? First of all, repent. And quit what you're doing. But Sheikh, I'm a rapper. You see the bling blings it's underneath, you cannot see it. And uh, I do this and I do that and I make money. I can't quit, Sheikh. Then, then you're not repenting. The first step on the path of Jannah, the first foot you put is when you repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah says in the Quran, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Repent, all of you, O oh, who you believe, so that you might succeed. There is no success without repenting to Allah Azza wa Jal. We are all sinners, by the way. All of us, we have sins. But some of us have real big sins in economic pack. Some of us have small sins depending on their knowledge, on their environment. So the first thing for you to do, whoever had learned haram sciences, is to repent to Allah, to seek Allah's forgiveness, to show and express sincere and deep remorse to Allah. And if you see people doing it, warn them. And never to do that again. And inshallah, all of this will turn into good deeds with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. The, the next question for Sheikh Awesome. I have committed zina and repented. How do I face the consequences? When people ask me this question, usually it involves a lot of shame and scandal. And this is something you have no control of. A person commits zina. If it's in secret, he repents, shows remorse, he cries day and night, he asks Allah forgiveness, he does a lot of good deeds and a lot of good deeds and he increases in iman, increases in iman, he's not satisfied, he's not satisfied, increases in iman until he dies and goes straight to Jannah. No sins at all. This is no problem, this is easy. I wish everybody had the opportunity to do this. But the questioner usually 
when they ask about consequences, they have problems. So the sister committed zina, and the man she committed zina with has her photos in very bad positions, and he's threatening her, and he exposed to expose her. Now five years, ten years down the line, she repented, she practiced. Mashallah, everything is fine. She's about to get married, or she's already married, and all of a sudden, this devil surfaces and says, "Ha ha! I have pictures. What to do?" Or a brother who has heinous past, and he has Facebook, Twitter, Instagram accounts with New Year, Christmas, partying all night long, and now. He's ashamed because everybody has it. He contacted Muhammad Abdullah Ali, please erase it. Some did, some said, nope, we're happy with it. So now he is asking, what should I do about the consequences? Or someone who has a child out of wedlock. These are two different things. The sin itself, you'd repented, you sought Allah's forgiveness, and you expressed Sincere remorse, Allah forgave you. Alhamdulillah, good news. Now the bad news is, the consequences will remain with you forever. And this is a test and a calamity from Allah. You have no control over that. So what to do, Shaykh? Uh, a woman comes and says, this man had an affair with me uh, uh, 55 years ago. You know that old Shaykh? <laughs> you never know. I was born in the, in the previous century, by the way. That's old, how, how old I am. So she comes and says, this happened. What to do? I mm, kill her. What to do with the body? Mm, bury her. And then shaitan comes in place. You're going to a different level of sin. No. This is a calamity. You have no control over that. Say, try to dodge it. Try to... Uh, uh, deny it, but at the end of the day, this is a calamity that you must not cross the line to fight it or do something haram to fight it. Be patient, ask Allah for forgiveness, and make a lot of dua that Allah conceals your sin. And I think this is the best way of dealing with such consequences, and Allah knows best. MashaAllah. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Zabir. This is from a COP member. My question is that I am an NYC serving COP member posted to a village where 19,000 monthly alawi is enough is not enough for me and no any opportunity to do something there. We are made, uh, so we made a local arrangement with the local inspector to give him something each month. I can only go for clearance. What is the position of what I am? Uh, what is the position in Islam about this? Alhamdulillah. Um, I will say that right to the NYSC DG, he will be able to issue this fatwa, but I can't actually. You know, there are a lot of issues attached to fatwa. Now, this is a national issue. Do you want me to say, yeah, go and have your local arrangement? And after all, many people will justify it by saying that, yeah, we had a fatwa that you can do that. So I cannot issue a fatwa on this. I think this requires um, more than a scholar. There are issues that are called nawazil. It requires more than one scholar, people with the technical know-how, people with the knowledge of the local community, people with the knowledge of Islam, all together to come and give a fatwa, just like Legend of Da'ima sometimes issues a fatwa. So I cannot issue a fatwa on this, I'm sorry. All right, uh, mashallah, tabarakallah. The Sheikh didn't offer a fatwa. Most of us, I didn't go to the camp and uh, paying Alawi for no going for clearance. So most of you? Most of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, the next question goes to John Fontaine. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Bowing to greet our parent, is it a form of shirk too? I cannot issue the fatwa. It is supported in Sunan Tirmidhi that someone asked the Prophet Sallallahu Ahduna yaltaqi ma'asahibihi ayan hani'la Someone meeting with his uh, friend, shall he bow for him? He said, la. Qala ayusafihahu, qala na'am. 
Shall he make a handshake? The Prophet Sallallahu said yes. So bowing to greet someone who is standing is not recommended. Now if he's sitting down, also it's not recommended you greet him while you are standing. Why? Because there's a fantastic hadith. Once a, the Prophet Sallallahu prayed sitting down while companions were behind him praying standing. فَأَشَارَ إِلَيْهِمْ أَنِجْلِسُ He pointed to them that sit down. After the prayer, he said, إِنْ كِتُّمْ آنِفًا لِتَفْعَلُونَ فِئِلَ فَارِسَ وَالرُّومُ يَقُومُونَ عَلَى مُلُوكِهِمْ وَهُمْ قُعُودٌ فَلَا تَفْعَلُوا You are about a moment ago, you are about to do the actions of people of uh, patients, the, the worshippers of fire and room, the Christians. They used to stand for their kings while the kings are sitting down. فَلَا تَفْعَلُوا Do not do that. Some scholars said the illa in this is اختلاف amal. Once we meet your sheikh or your father standing, you have to greet him while standing. When he's sitting, you need to greet him while sitting. You cannot meet him sitting down and throw a greeting from him because you are newly admitted into Izala. That's wrong. You need to sit down and greet him. Or also, if he's standing, you can't bow down for him. Bowing is for Allah. Wallahu ta'ala alam. But I know Sheikh Asim will add to that, inshallah. <laughs> Uh, all right, mashallah, Sheikh um, Dr. Jadir. The next question goes to you. Can uh, Akramakumullah, can a menstruating woman pick the Quran? Can what? A menstruating woman pick the Quran. Pick the Quran. There's differences of opinion of scholars about this. A menstruating, a menstruating woman, can she pick the Quran? Albani is of the opinion that she can. Uh, and also is the opinion of school of Zahiri. Zahiri school is the opinion of Ibn Hazm. The majority of scholars including the four school of jurisprudence, including the fatwa of legend Daima, including Sheikh Muhammad bin Salil Uthaymin, will tell you no. But she has to use, some scholars say she can use hand gloves to touch it. Because if she use hand gloves, she's not touching the Quran directly. And I, I'm inclined to this fatwa. When she uses hand gloves, inshallah, she can read it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. But uh, the final fatwa will be from Sheikh Asim, inshallah. We need, I need confirmation or negation. Uh, all right, the next question goes to Brother John. Uh, please, I want more clarification on the issue of the companion gene mentioned by Brother John, because I have never heard of it before. What, what is this? I cannot issue this button. No, I think it's from your question, from your lecture about the companion gene. Uh, you know, someone having a gene. Yeah, the Prophet ﷺ told us that each person has a kareem, a gene which accompanies them throughout their life. And also the Prophet himself also had uh, a kareem as well, but he was a Muslim. He was somebody who had managed to convert to Islam. So yeah, this is Mashallah tabarakallah. Um, the next question regarding parenting, uh, you say we shouldn't be different between kids in giving gifts. What if the gift is due to an excellent or rather outstanding performance one of one of them had which is promised? I think this was a lecture that was given by Brother Ashraf. So I think it's better for Abra Ashraf to answer the question and then he has to come up, mashallah. So the, the, the question that was asked was, he talked about in his lecture that gifts, parents should give, give equally to their kids, but the question is asking what if the one, one of the kids took first position and the other did not take first position, what do you do? Um, I'm not very sure about special gifts, but I do know I read the hadith where a man went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he said that, and he went with his with his child, and he said that I have provided, uh, I have given this child uh, a slave, and so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him if he had given his other kids um, that slave, um, you know, a similar gift, uh, you know, of similar value. And he said no, so the Prophet ﷺ told him to take it back. So maybe if the kids had equal opportunities to get this gift, 
and only one was successful and you already promised them beforehand that okay if one was successful then maybe but Allah and I'm, I'm not sure thank you I, I haven't spoken for a while so I need to do something otherwise like sharks you know if they didn't move they died suffocate so yes Jazallah uh, brother Ashraf what he has stated is true in the sense that Hadith of Abu Naaman ibn Bashir ibn Sa'd, may Allah be pleased with him, when Al Bashir ibn Sa'd gave his son Al Naaman a gift, a slave or a property. His mother, the daughter of Rawaha, said, I will not accept it until you make the Prophet a witness. So when he told the Prophet, and like Brother Asraf said, he asked a specific question Did you give all of them the same? He said, No. So he asked him another question. Would you like them all to be kind and dutiful to you? And he said, yes, of course. The Prophet said, in this case, you have to be equal to them in gifts. And another narration, he said, make someone else testify. I do not witness injustice. And he, in another narration, said, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ أَوْلَادِكُمْ Fear Allah Azza wa Jal and be just between your offspring. There are two things that you usually give to your children. Either it's a gift or something that they require and need. In giving, in giving a gift, whether he's an A, uh, uh, a uh, student or uh, someone who's excelling in shores and, and work at, at, uh, at home or obedient to you, a gift is a gift. You cannot favor one over the other because the other would hate and envy and maybe do to his brother what the brothers of Yusuf did to Yusuf. Why did they do this? Their father was a prophet. He wasn't unfair, but he loved him more. And this is why the Prophet said to a man who had a boy and a girl. And he used to favor and kiss the boy. And when the girl comes, he shoves her next to him and he doesn't kiss. He said, you're not fair. Even in kisses, you have to be fair with your children. So this you have to be equal with. But if your son goes to university and the other son goes to grade one at school, the one that goes to university, you give him pocket money far more greater than the one in grade one because this is not a gift this is something that they need to live if one of my children goes to hospital and i i pay to operate on him a hundred thousand naira, the others can't come in the evening and say okay daddy give us equal amount you don't deserve it because he was in dire need in uh, uh, um, this is maintenance and not as giving this breaks your heart because this son is obedient, is kind, and this one is a rebellious one. Yet in Eid, in Saudi, we give in Eid to our children like most Muslims uh, after Ramadan. So we buy them presents. We have to be equal in the presents for the one who goes to university and for the one who is two years of age. The same financial and Allah knows best. Now your question, Sheikh. You can hold the mic, mashallah. This is your question. Like, Except by the belt. Alright, uh, Sheikh. Subhanallah, Brother Jamil doesn't want to give me cold water. But he does give me barakallah. Ask me why. Did you know? Because you don't have a wife. <laughs> Can you pretend you didn't hear that? Let's get serious. The next question for Sheikh Asim. I have a question actually. For you. <laughs> Do you have a wife? Do you know? I'm asking. You don't know. That's why I'm asking. I'll be you later. You don't know. <laughs> All right, mashallah. Next question goes to Sheikh Asin. Uh, please emphasize on female uh, wearing perfume. Is it halal or haram? Is the perfume halal or haram, or wearing it is halal or haram? Wearing it. Right. The, the, the issue of wearing perfume for females is clearly mentioned in 
a number of authentic hadith the prophet said alayhi salatu salam ayyama mra'atin istaatarat fa marrat ala qawmin wajadu rihaha fa hiya kada wa kada that any woman who wears perfume and she passes by a group of men who can find her scent her smell her odor then she is so and so meaning she is a fornicator an adulteress and abu huraira may allah be pleased with her and uh, with him saw a woman and he asked her where are you going o amatul jabbar she said i'm going to the masjid he said to her i heard the prophet sallam, say that any woman who wears perfume and attends isha prayer must go back and perform total ghusl otherwise allah will not accept her prayer and these hadiths are scary seriously yani a righteous practicing woman abiding by the hijab and she wears perfume question mark why are you doing this for your own self put a lot of perfume on your niqab oh good smell and you will smell good perfume all the time and nobody can find it but you're not doing it because most of the sisters when asked they said well we it's hot here in nigeria and we may have body odor and this may smell bad to whom to other women no problem you stay with other women and men will not find your perfume but you do this for other men say sheikh i work in an office with other colleagues female colleagues no male colleagues what are you doing and you're wearing perfume and i say sheikh i have to wear some you know foundation makeup and just to look fairer and just to look presentable you are falling from one hole to the other to the other to the other you're missing path of jannah definitely your gps is not working right you should abide by what pleases allah mother aisha tells us about the women of the ansar who used to attend salatul fajri that they used to be wrapped in their clothes and their uh, 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 covering that they look like black crows no one recognizes them and they leave immediately and go home nowadays we find women wearing hijab yes technically speaking but you can hear her laughter from the end of the corridor what kind of hijab is this this is not the proper hijab don't soften your voice don't crack jokes see now even the it's been monitored so now they're trying to interrupt my my speech <laughs> anyhow you got my message it is prohibited to put perfume if you are in your home inshallah if you shower with perfume it's okay if you are with your husband mashallah excellent but i know out of experience my wife never takes good care of her self unless she's doing it for someone else for me no i'm the last on the list why it's been 36 years we've been married she doesn't break through and she does not obligate ghusl so what what is she interested in yeah but this is wrong if you do this for your mahrams no problem for the women no problem but be careful one non mahram man finding this smell of your coco chanel or whatever you are in deep doo-doo um mashallah tabarakallah the next question goes to sheikh uh, brother fontaine <clears throat> uh please i want you to kindly call our youth on the implication of listening to music wallahi we as parents are trying our possible best to make them God fearing and stop listening to music, but to no avail. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As you know, I used to be a jazz singer, and I also was a DJ as well. <laughs> Shall I sing you a song, Sheikh? <laughs> you know, Subhanallah. I recently released a video of a friend of mine, he was speaking about music. And a lot of the time we speak about whether it's haram or halal, etc. But there's, there's another point to music. You know, if you're involved in music, it takes over your life. 
you know yourself, if you've listened to music, subhanAllah, I was just in the hotel before, and before I was adjusting, I, was, I used to also play the church organ in church. And they was playing some classical music in the hotel. And subhanAllah, just as I got out of the lift, the song was in my head. Because I knew, I knew the song. I wasn't trying to listen to it. But halfway down the corridor, I was remembering the song. And this is the type of effect that music has. And we know, everyone knows that music is haram. It's not permissible to use the musical instruments. And it has a huge effect on your life. And it wastes so much time. Like, seriously, even all these years after not listening to music, I've not listened to music for 10 years. And when I came to Islam, I used to make a lot of money from singing. But I gave it up for the sake of Allah. You know, I used to make sometimes 5,000 pounds to sing for 30 minutes. Can you imagine? And I left this and I didn't have a job. I even ended up taking benefits from the government when I first came to Islam. But subhanAllah, after some time, you don't like music, you don't like sound. You, it, it takes some time to get the music out, but you have to go cold turkey. You know cold turkey? I'm not talking about the cold food, the chicken. <laughs> I'm talking about leaving it fully for the sake of Allah. So what I did, I gathered all my CDs and music. And at the time I was living in a, an apartment. So I ran down the stairs and I threw all the CDs in the bin. And this is the worst thing that I ever did. <laughs> because the brother, well not a brother, but a man who lived underneath me, he went and took all the CDs out of the bin and I was listening to them for the next six months. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So if you do have the CDs, I recommend disposing of them uh, properly so that no one else actually gets hold of them. But seriously, for the youth, I highly recommend just leave the music. It's as simple as that. Leave the music and replace it with something else. You know, you have... I personally don't like machines. I'm not, I'm not saying they're haram, but I don't like anything what is even like music. Because it, it has a similar effect. So I just recommend for the youth just to leave it alone. Just to move away from it and find something else. Jazakallah khair. Uh, um, one other thing. I think there was this video that I watched um, on YouTube. I don't know, it was a couple of years ago. When, when discussing whether music is halal or not, that's not really the big issue because everyone has already figured that out. But you need to look at the sort of music that you listen to. Listen to the words that they're saying and actually try and understand. Because nowadays we have a lot of people who actually memorize full songs not fully knowing what they're saying. Not fully understanding what these rappers and these people are trying to say. And these things can have a subconscious effect on you. And you might get desensitized to these things. So you need to be careful what you listen to and you need to be careful what you allow yourself to get used to. MashaAllah, yeah. tabarakallah. For most of, not us, that are addicted to music, may Allah help us and uh, give us the ability to stop listening to it and listen to something much more better. It's a struggle, it's a gradual process. May Allah see us through. The next question is, what are the conditions for accepting forgiveness and tawbah from Allah? There are three uh, conditions mentioned by Sahib al-Ahbari. Uh, number one, uh, tawbah to nasuha. It shall be sincere repentance. It shall be sincere repentance. Number two, you should stop what you are doing at that moment. This is a common book that is read in all house land, almost in, in West Africa generally. It's the first book of uh, Fiqh of Maliki. Uh, he mentioned the conditions of Tawbah. He said the first thing is that it shall be sincere, at Tawbah to Nasuha. Then you shall leave the sin at the moment if you are practicing it, at that moment. If you want to repent, for instance, from smoking, 
it shouldn't be when I finish the carton or when I finish uh, even the what do you call the what do you call a single cigarette when I finish what not the, the stick it shouldn't be when I finish the stick you shall stop it at the moment when you want to repent uh, number three if it is related to others then you have to seek also their forgiveness that I wronged someone I took his wealth I took his property I have to pay back number four it should be before the sun rises from the west before the sun rises from the west uh, uh, these are the conditions I could remember the bad other this number four that it shall be before the sun rises from the from the west another mu'alama part you have to also show uh, another you have to show remorse about what you did there's authentic hadith about another authenticated by Albani rahimahullah in Sayyid al -Jame. the Prophet sallallahu said another mutawba the remorse itself is a tawbah. It's like, it's like saying Al-Hajj Arafah, that Hajj is the most significant act of, uh, Arafah is the most significant act of Hajj, and so the most significant uh, pillar. So also remorse, showing remorse is the most significant uh, pillar of repentance. Wallahu ta'ala. And one more last condition is that you intend not to do it again. Al-Azmu ala adam al awda because I can repent. We are in November, are we? No? So I came back from my vacation. I felt bad about the partying and the boozing and the, everything I did. And I went for Umrah. I live in Jeddah, so Umrah is like half an hour away. And I came back, alhamdulillah, I'm clean. I called my travel agent. Akhi, what hotel did you put us in? This is awful. Next year, inshallah, put us in something that is much better. So I'm intending to do it next year. This repentance is not accepted at all because I have the intention to do it. And Allah knows what. Nami, a question, Chef. Um, I am a young lady of 34 years old. Uh, I've been suffering from gene attack, and as a result of that, I lost my first husband. And for almost two years now, any man that comes, he goes away. Any man that comes, he goes away. And I've been going to one malam from another, one scholar from another, just to seek for help. Uh, SubhanAllah, what do you think is the way out? First of all, I have a very bad experience with jinn. No, seriously. Uh, I have a bad experience with jinn because 95% of the questions I get, and you know, I have a website that answers a lot of questions from the Muslims worldwide and 95% it's all imagination so we have a tendency as Muslims to hang our problems on the hanger of evil eye black magic jinn and envy whenever my wife is nagging and she is making trouble in my house I tell people, she's possessed, she has jinn. Whenever my son fails in a subject because he didn't study, I say, wallahi, somebody gave him an evil eye. Look at him, so gorgeous, so handsome, look, no, he failed. If my boss does not give me increment and a raise, I say that this is black magic of my mother-in-law. She doesn't want me to make money. And if something happens, a flat tire, of my car, I say this is envy. Everybody's envious of me. While none of this is true. All of it is my own self. So I'm not saying that the sister does not have jinn. Jinn possession is mentioned in the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah. Those who uh, 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 consume riba. La yaqumuna illa kama yaqumu alladhi yatakhabbatuhu shaytanu min al-mas. So the shaitan does possess. But you have to know, is it actually jinn possession that made you leave your husband? Or was it your attitude, the way you did not take care of him, the way you did not respect his family? So many causes of divorce between the spouses that it's like a camel's hump. A camel cannot see his back. And most brothers who divorce don't see their back they don't see their own shortcomings and likewise with the sisters and I, this is what i do when i do marriage counseling i sit with the brothers he tells me my wife does this 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 i say you 
the wife should be hanged. And when I listened to the sister, she says, my husband does this, this, this. I said, your husband should be standing in front of a, sh a firing squad. And when they, they come sit together and talk to me, half of what they had said does not appear because it's all lies. So, assuming that you do have jinn possession, this is a test from Allah Azza wa Jal, but no one on earth can cure you except Allah. Can ever there be a cure other than Allah Azza wa Jal? If Allah Azza wa Jal inflicts harm on you, no one can cure you except Allah. So if you have this conviction, all what you have to do is sincerely head towards Allah in dua. Make ruqya upon yourself multiple times a day, not once. The brothers comes to me and say, oh, I have problems for 10 years and I make ruqya. How many times you make ruqya? I say, I make ruqya once in the morning. And what about the rest of the day? No. What ruqya do you say? I recite fatha once. I said, no, recite it five times. I said, oh, too, much, too many. <laughs> you have problems of 10 years. You want it to be cured with one fatiha? Yeah, he put some five. Oh, too long, Sheikh, too long. Ayat al-Kursi, last two ayahs of Surah al-Baqarah, last three quls. Oh, that's a lot, Sheikh. I'd rather be possessed. Thank you. Zakallah khair. You have a problem. The brothers come to me and say, can we make Salatul Istikhara? I said, yes, this is Sunnah. He said, I have six things to do Istikhara for. Can I make them in one Salah? People are cheap. Seriously. So, in order for you to solve your jinn possession, you have to make Ruqya on yourself. You have to read a lot. The adhkar of the morning, the evening, before you go to bed, after fart prayers, and before you leave your home. You have to get protected. You have to, some people call it antivirus. We have that on our computers. No, you have to have anti-jinn. Protect yourself and make ruqya. And with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, you will find that inshallah you have nothing wrong with you. But if you do, the jinn will take leave and leave you. As for the marriage, this is in Allah's hands. Make dua. And whenever the time is right, Allah will send you a proper husband that would cherish you, love you, and take care of you. May Allah Azza wa Jal cure all of our sick people's illnesses and grant them long life and good health. And those who are not married, may Allah Azza wa Jal get them a righteous spouse. It was reported, and Dr. Jabir knows this because he's specialized in hadith, that shirarukum Uzzabukum. The worst of you all are those who are single. But the hadith is fabricated, unfortunately. <laughs> but I thought of just mentioning. Uh, points to take back home, the hadith is fabricated. Uh, mashallah, Dr. Mama Salah is here. Barakallah, fi marhaba, Sheikh. So, what's your question now? Uh, it just says that everything is pre uh, predestined. But I read that dua changes Qadr. Please clarify. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, indeed, it is in the sound hadith. La yaruddul qadara illa dua. Nothing words, words of al qadar, which is a preordainment, other than the supplication. And that is simply all included in the preordainment. It's like in the preordainment that this person is destined to be afflicted on that day with such and such affliction. Unless if he supplicates, then the supplication will ward off and will block this affliction. So, يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ Allah has everything recorded in the preserved tablet. And Al-Qadr is the blueprint which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained in it what will happen to every person and everything until the day of judgment, before it happens. If the person to, were to make dua, like some supplications we recite every morning, every evening, 
بسم الله الذي لا يضر مع اسمه شيء في الارض ولا في السماء وهو السميع العليم in the name of Allah with whose name nothing hurts nothing harms in the heavens nor on the earth and he is the all hearer the all knowing so mashallah you remember to say this supplication in the morning and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said whoever says it three times in the morning will be protected till the evening and whoever recites it three times in the evening will be protected till the morning you forgot to say it then you will be exposed to what you were preordained to experience of an affliction also another hadith explains how both the dua the supplication and al-qadr have a combat يعتلجان. the dua is ascending and the qadr is descending and they combat and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said فيغلب الدعاء القدر so the supplication will overcome what was preordained and it is all by the leave of Allah so inshallah to the last question we we'll go to Dr. Jabir uh, a politician paid me a hard ticket from people's treasury I went and I performed it what is the position of my heart? Firstly, how do you know it is from uh, people's treasury? How do you know that? Now, the principle is that when someone has two earnings, one is halal, one is haram, when he gives you something, you can take. That is why we can socialize, we can interact financially with Ahl al-Kitab. Some of their earnings are not legal. While others are legal, then you are allowed to interact with him, firstly. So if you don't know, he has a salary, and he is also a politician in Nigeria. When we say politicians, we know what we mean. He has the legal earnings and, and non-legal earnings. Then you are allowed to interact with him. You are allowed to take a gift from him and what, what have you, number one. Number two, if this politician is a head of state, like a president, or is the governor, or is the chairman of the local government, he can use people's treasury to sponsor you to Hajj. It is up to him to decide where to put the money. When someone in authority, like the head, gives you a money from the public fund, you can take it. There is authentic hadith in, in Sunan Abi Dawood. Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah ibn Umar, If you are given from public treasury, without you asking, you can take. But who has the authority to give you? The person in charge, the wali in amr, the president, the governor, the, one, the local government chairman, he can give you. But if it's someone that he is not in charge, it's just like an assistant, like a minister, like a senator, like a director, and he told you that, look, this fund is from the public fund, it's not from my pocket, it's not from my salary, then you can't take it because you know it's haram. He's not in authority to give you first, and secondly, it's from the public fund. But if you don't know, he just give to you, then you can take his gift to Allah Ta'ala. Mashallah, I thought the question came in, okay. I thought the question came in when I said that, uh, uh, I was nominated to perform hard as guest of the king. This is not politician, this is the Saudi that gave me the privilege. Yeah, yeah look, there's something <laughs> like the, the, the custodian of two holy moxies, uh, King Salman Hafizahullah, he can nominate people to go for Hajj with the public fund. He's the public fund. So the president of Nigeria can also do that to appoint people from Nigeria to sponsor them. The governor of Kano State can also do that. To you, you can accept whatever is given to you from the public fund if you didn't ask for it. But some people with wara, what is wara, Sheikh, in English? Sheikh Salah? Piety. Some people with piety wouldn't take it, like Imam Muhammad. Imam Muhammad issued a fatwa that you can take from the public fund. But when he was afflicted with Ma'amun and others that, um, that he suffered from their hand, when Mutawakkel gave him, he didn't take it. And his, uh, his children said, but you issued a fatwa that when a ruler gives you, we can take. He said, but I don't need it. So if you have that war, that piety, you can take it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. MashaAllah tabarakallah. So uh, we've come to the end of uh, the event. But alhamdulillah, inshallah, we'll give the mic to Sheikh Azim for just a final word. And, you know, something we can all take back home. Uh, let me... Let me... Okay, let's give it to Muhammad Salah. Sheikh. أنت الشيخ الكبير. ما شاء الله. Can I take selfie with you? Please.
एक्सपेंसिव से लगी <laughs> माशाल्लाह What 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 a free selfie! That moment when you wish you were just like this boy to get a free selfie. Allah, Allah Akbar. Allah Sheikh Hasan. Okay, Inshallah, we'll make dua. But before that, as I was speaking earlier about the shield and the protection against many many diseases, including porn addiction. which is increasing the level of uh, the iman these conventions and these gatherings are one of the greatest means of increasing the level of iman yani if i may ask you quickly who actually those who attended today do you think that you have or you may have benefited today something really useful that you go home with raise your hand if you did allahu akbar allahu akbar allahu akbar Okay, one more question. Normally, subhanallah, in the case of a believer, whenever he indulges into a sin like the sin that the brother mentioned, he, he, he or she feels depressed. They feel dirty. They feel bad about it. But subhanallah, those who have been sitting here since the morning, even though it may be hot in some areas, and you can find your seat, you don't have the convenience of You know, wandering around at home, watching TV and doing whatever, grabbing something to eat. But you feel happy. Do you really feel happy being present here? Raise your hand if you do. Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, wallahi, this is a sign of increasing the level of Iman. So take it from there. And would like to crown that by making dua. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. to increase the level of our iman and to keep us all steadfast on the straight path. Allahumma ya muqallid al-quloob wal absar thabbit quloobana ala deenik. Allahumma thabbit quloobana ala deenik. Allahumma thabbit quloobana ala mahabbatik. Allahumma thabbit quloobana ala ta'atik. Allahumma aghfil lana zunubana wa kaffir anna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'al abrar. اللهم هيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا وادعنا من عبيدك السعدا اللهم اغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أخرنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت أنت حسبنا ونعم الوكيل اللهم إنا نعوذ بك أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك لما لا نعلمه ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وسلام على المرسلين وصلى الله على سيد الأولين والآخرين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين لقفط صلى الله عليه وسلم سيد من لا يشكر الناس لا يشكر الله One who is not grateful to people who do him a favor or favors He is not grateful to Allah. We can never forget those who are behind this gathering. The organizers, the volunteers, those who funded the event to make it accessible to happen. So for everyone who happened to take part in this event and make it possible, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah forgive your sins. May Allah make your love the happiest and reward you with the greatest reward in the hereafter. Jazakumullahu khairan. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. ما شاء الله دكتور جابر. نو. اي راسكو دو مستر جميل فور ذا كلوزنج ريمارك. اند جاست بيفور ذات ذا شيك بوت ا حديث من لم يشكر الناس يشكر الله. ااا اور سيستر دونيتد بوكس اند وات ذا كول ات بوكس اند قران. مي الله بليس اند جرانت ذا هايست رانك ان جنرال. امين امين. ان شاء الله. Enarrate, creating a new narrative.